Welcome to Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful you've decided to join us, and we hope you'll be encouraged as you participate in the service today. Pastor Robbie Hendrick is here to lead us, so let's join him in the sanctuary and offer ourselves in worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church Presbyterian. We're so glad that you're here. Every week, our numbers are getting a little bit bigger. We're very thankful for that, how blessed we are to be able to gather on this, the Sabbath day, to worship the Lord together. Uh, it amazes me how much is going on in the life of the church at a time where we're just now beginning to get our feet wet again, but there are a lot. So let me just run through a lot of those things for us very, very quickly. Uh, this morning, we are going to be celebrating Holy Communion together. You see this behind me. There's going to be some instruction given right before we partake that will kind of help you to understand how we're going to do it because we're not going to pass the plates, but all of that will be explained, so just be, be listening for that as we get closer. Uh, also, to let you know, that the letter that was sent out this week said that our videos for today would be posted on Tuesday. That's a mistake. Our videos from today, both to this morning and tonight, will not be posted until next Sunday. That gives us a little more time, just like our radio broadcast, to get caught up and to make sure that the editing is done. So it will not be posted on Tuesday. If you start looking for it, you're not going to be able to find it. Uh, we are glad to have the choir back. They're way up there in the back, and they can barely see me by the time they sit, but they're all waving at you down here, so we're glad to have them. Uh, tonight, we are going to have our Sunday evening worship service as usual, uh, so please come back tonight and end the Lord's Day with us. Uh, next week, we are going to have a guest to come and speak for just a few minutes who's going uh, into the mission field, into the call of ministry, and so that'll be fun to, to kind of launch that, but tonight, come back at 6 o'clock to close out the day together. Uh, today's service, oh, I think I've already said that, will not post till next week. Oh, good. Uh, we are going to hold off on Sunday school for just a couple of more weeks. We're still trying to do, uh, follow the guidelines that have been set before us on social distancing and all of those kinds of things. And it's really, really hard to do social distancing with babies in the nursery. So we're going to hold off on that for a couple more weeks with our children. And we're still going to do Sunday school through Zoom with the adults. So you can still catch that. But make sure that you understand the time. We do it a little bit earlier so that it gives you time to come here on Sunday morning. Also, don't forget to drop off your tithe and offerings uh, in the plate that's in the back because we're not going to pass those for a season. And don't forget to record your attendance with us. Uh, every week when we meet as a staff, we basically say 40 people signed the register, but we had 90 who showed up. So please register your attendance with us so that we know that you came. We can stay connected with you and all that goes with that. Now, if you have been here and you're looking around and you see over the last couple of weeks somebody that you love but that you haven't seen, give them a call. Just check in on them. See how they're doing. I think it's very appropriate for us to do that. And so if you've been here and you're looking around and you're wondering, you know, I haven't seen so-and-so, give them a call. It's very important that we live as a community together. We are here to worship the Lord. Let's begin to prepare our hearts, not only to celebrate who he is and to praise his holy name and to hear the preaching of his word, but even as we prepare our hearts for the table. Let's quiet our hearts and get ready for worship.
Our call to worship comes from Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. It is God himself who calls us to worship him. Hear his words this morning. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Because of this truth in the Bible, we get to gather and bless his holy name. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to be able to gather in your name this morning and to worship you. And Lord, we are grateful even in this time and in this season of life that we can look to you, the ultimate in power, the ultimate in sovereignty, the ultimate in goodness. And Lord, we pray that even today you would guard our hearts from distraction and allow us to focus upon you and you alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Normally we combine our prayer of confession as well as our pastoral prayer together uh, today because we're partaking communion together. We're going to push the prayer of confession toward the end of the service. And so what I'd like to do today, because my heart is just kind of ripped open with everything that's going on in this country, I'm going to focus on the pastoral prayer for this country only. And I'm going to actually use the scriptures to do that from Psalm 85. The Bible God gave us the Psalms as a way for us, not only for him to reveal his truth to us, but also as a way for us to pray back to him if we can't find the words. And sometimes it's just hard to find the words. And so this morning, uh, we pray for our nation in our pastoral prayer, and then we're going to end together reciting and praying through the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be able to come to you this morning and to lift up our nation. We thank you for your great power. We praise you for your truth through the scriptures. We're grateful that you have set us free from the clutching grasp of sin and death. And Lord, we pray that you would be with your people, that you would extend your grace, that you would continue to grant freedom from sin that you would continue to provide your protection and empower your people not only with strength, but with peace. We do ask, Lord, that you would bring about an awakening of your presence in America today as never before seen. We ask that your name would be proclaimed and that all plans to silence the name of Jesus would be thwarted and crushed. We do thank you for your inerrant and infallible word and how 
in so many ways. It teaches us the truth of who you are and who we are. And God, as we think through the Psalms, we are grateful that you have even given us words to pray back to you in times of deep trouble. And so, Lord, our prayer this morning is to pray back to you Psalm 85. Lord, you are favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all of their sin. You withdrew all of your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Man, it is great to have the choir back. And in two weeks, we are going to join them in praising the Lord with our voices. That's one of the announcements I didn't say earlier, but I thought I'd throw it in now. John chapter 6 is where we are. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 36 through 59. Let me give you just a little bit of a background here as we dig back into John. Last week, we saw that the people came to Jesus, but they asked the wrong question. They said, Jesus, when did you get here? And this is, of course, after Jesus has walked across the water. The right question should have been, uh, how did you get here? And it would have been great to hear Jesus say, well, I walked, and them not have a clue what that meant. So really, they had the wrong motive once they even asked the wrong question because they said, give us this bread. They were longing for more signs or more miracles or more food or more blessings, but they did not want more of a relationship with Christ. They only wanted what he offered, and what he offered was himself, and that they rejected. They were trying to attain those blessings then by doing works themselves. Tell us what we must do to do the works of God. And Jesus corrects their thinking by his first I am saying in the book of John. He says, I am the bread of life. You're looking for blessings from heaven. I am from heaven. You're looking for bread that sustains life. I am the bread that gives eternal life. You want to know what to do to attain it. Believe in the one whom God sent. And that was Jesus' response. Jesus says, I am the one God sent. I'm the bread that came from heaven, just like the manna. And by believing in me, I'm the one that gives eternal life. So Jesus has just said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. And that's where we cut it off last week. He's still talking as we pick up the conversation in verse 36. John chapter 6, verse 36. Hear the inerrant and infallible word of God. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father." That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your father ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. 
Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful this morning to gather and to listen to our choir sing praise to your name. Lord, to pray to you and now to hear from you in your word. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to comprehend what you have for us. And we pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts to be more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we know that Jesus is the ultimate teacher, and we should not be surprised when Jesus uses different types of teaching to teach those around him. We know at times that he teaches in parables, uh, which are really stories with a point. In Matthew 13, the Bible tells us all of these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. We have read many of these over the years, the parable of the tenants and the hidden treasures and the pearl of great value and the parable of the weeds and the parable of the sower. The list goes on and on. It is a method that Jesus uses to teach his people. We also know that Jesus sometimes speaks in metaphors, like last week when he says, I am the bread of life, and he says it again in this passage. Now, this is not a metaphor in the sense that Jesus is not like the bread of life. He actually is the bread of life, but he did compare himself to bread. And he's going to later compare himself, of course, to light and a good shepherd and a true vine as we work our way through John. The problem is that the people don't understand the parables and they don't understand the metaphors. It's like with my children growing up, and I try to teach them a lesson by telling them a story. How many times in my life have I shared with my children, I want to tell you a story about a rabbit who was overconfident in his speed, and a turtle came by and said, I would love to race you, and the rabbit says, ha, and the turtle wins because the rabbit was overconfident. And they look at me and they say, I don't get it. (laughs) So many times we don't understand metaphors. We don't understand parables. When that happens, my response is, let me explain. This is what Jesus is doing in this passage. It's time for plain speech. Jesus is looking at the people and he's saying, I'm going to tell you right now, no metaphors, no stories, no illustrations. Here is the truth straight up. Verse 37 says, you see me and yet you don't believe. Therefore, here's the truth. And what we're going to see is the plan of God, who's going to accomplish that plan, and how we the people are supposed to remember it. The first thing we see is Jesus explain to the people what is called the decree of God or what we call the plan of God. Now, sometimes it's called the covenant of redemption, okay, just to kind of give you a, this broad spectrum. In your outline, I use the decree of God or the plan of God. The word decree simply means an official decision that has been made. Verses 38 through 40, he explains God's decree to save his people or what most of us would call actually his plan. See, when it comes to the creation of the world and the salvation of God's people, God is not making this up as he goes along. He had a plan from the beginning, a plan to save his people even before they fell in the garden. This is called the covenant of redemption. The word covenant simply means one-sided. God alone made it. It's a bond, meaning never to be broken. That covenant is in blood, and we're going to see this later with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's sovereignly administered, which means God is the only one who carries it out. A one-sided bond in blood, sovereignly administered. Now, this covenant of redemption or plan of God or decree of God is spelled out here in the passage. No metaphors, no parables, just simple, plain speech. Jesus is saying, if you don't get the story of the tortoise and the hare, you, this, I, can't, I can't make it any simpler than this. And here's what he says. Letter A, God the Father made a plan. Now we saw this a little bit last week. Verse 29 tells us, believe in him whom God has sent. Who sent? God sent. 
God is the one who sent Jesus. We see it in verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me. God's will is being exercised by his power. It was God's plan to redeem. God instituted and initiated the plan. He's the one that gave his son. God the Father made the plan. That's A. B, he also gives his people to Jesus. Verse 37 tells us, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And verse 44 tells us, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This word draw means to compel. God draws his people to himself. This is very important in the covenant of redemption or in the plan of God. C, those that God draws to Christ, Jesus saves all that come to him. Verse 39 says, I lose none. Verse 40 says, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And once Jesus saves those that the Father has given him, this is letter D, Jesus actually secures those that he saves. Meaning that once they are saved, they will never be lost. Now listen carefully, there are three ways to lose something. One is by simple accident. You take a pet for a walk and he breaks away and runs. Maybe it's forgetfulness of where you put something or the stupidity that I have of putting my cup on top of the car and driving off. Yes, I'm the only one that's ever done that. So one way to lose something is by pure accident. Another way to lose something is by theft. Someone comes in and steals it. The third way to lose something is by simple desire or lack of desire. You look at it and you go, you know what, I don't really want it anymore. And if something happened to it, that would be okay with me. And it's neglected and it goes away. Jesus says, none of these three things will ever be true about your salvation. Verse 37, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You know what he's saying? I'm never not going to want you. Verse 39, I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Jesus is saying, I love you enough to not let you escape. And I will always remember who and where you are at all times. I will never leave you on the hood of the car. And I'm wise enough to not leave you in a place of vulnerability. Verse 39 says, I will raise him up on the last day. This implies that I'm strong enough to keep you when the devil tries to steal you away. This covenant of redemption, this plan of God carries with it what we call the security of salvation or what we call the perseverance of the saints. Perseverance to the end. Because, letter E, Jesus raises those he secures. In fact, he says it four times in the passage. Verse 39, raise it up on the last day. Verse 40, I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, verse 54, I will raise him up on the last day. This really means to us that part of the plan, part of the covenant of redemption is the resurrection of the believer unto eternal life or what we call glorification. When we get to the end of this life, for those who are in Christ, heaven awaits. Amen. This is absolute plain speech about the covenant of redemption or God's decree or God's plan that he has given to and for his people. And Jesus says, no parables, no stories. Here it is straight up. It's God's plan. He gives his people to Jesus. Jesus saves all that he gets. He secures all that are saved, and he raises all of them to glory. So Jesus does this plan. 
He is the one that accomplishes the plan that God put in place. But now the question is, how? How does he accomplish the plan that God has put into place? Well, because we've read the end of the story, we know what this means. We know how Jesus accomplishes giving eternal life to those that God has given to him. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, goes to the cross and dies as our substitute for us. We know that the Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, I'll take the death and conquer it for you if you will look on to me and believe. When we, verse 40 says, look on to the Son and believe in him, we know what happens at that point. The scriptures are pretty clear. When we look onto the Son and believe in Him, His righteousness is then given to us, imputed to us, or credited to our account. And our sins are placed on Him, and He goes to the cross to pay for it. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of how Jesus is going to accomplish the decree or the plan of God. He pays for our sin by going to the cross and dying as our substitute. How does this happen? God's plan, it happens by God's grace alone. Verse 44 tells us, for the Father who sent me draws him. It's through faith alone. Verse 40 says, believe in him. And it's in Christ alone, verse 40 says, look onto the Son. By his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So Jesus accomplishes the decree of God by completing, satisfactorily, completely paying the debt that we owe. And giving us eternal life when we look on him and believe. Now, for a lot of us, this is fantastic news. In fact, most of us probably already knew this before we walked in because that's why we come. We come to celebrate God and his power and his plan and what he has done and what Christ has done on our behalf. We understand all of that. So we come in here this morning to, to praise God for it. And for many people, this is the good news of the gospel and it's fantastic. But what about the people in the passage? You know, for many people, when they hear this story, they reject it. They simply don't believe. Look at me at verses 41 to 43. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? When they heard about the bread of God, they wanted to be fed more and more and more. When they saw the loaves and the fish and how it multiplied over and over again, they were pretty excited that that's what they were going to get. Verse 34 says that they said, give us this bread always. But when they understood that the bread of life was Jesus, they despised it. They rejected and despised what they heard. And now all of a sudden, at this moment in time, Jesus says, plain speech is over. I've given you the truth. No illustrations, no parables. You reject the truth. So I'm going to go back to another metaphor. Verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You see the transition between plain speech and metaphorical speech? Verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? What does that tell us? They did not understand again. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, let me ask you this. How do we know that this language is metaphorical? How do we know that Jesus went back to speaking metaphorically here? Because we've already been told in this plain speech section exactly what we need to do to have eternal life. Everyone the Father gives, everyone who looks onto the Son and believes in Jesus. Verse 47, whoever believes has eternal life. All that the Father draws. And now here in 54, he says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Listen, this is not about a physical feeding on the body and the blood of Jesus. It is about believing that Jesus came to give his body and blood for our redemption and our salvation. Is there anybody out there somewhere? Jesus goes to the cross and dies for us. In other words, giving his flesh and blood as our substitute. Christ gave his flesh and blood for us to suffer and die. He did not give us his flesh and blood to us to be eaten. Remember that Jesus has already said, I'm the one who gives eternal life. I lose no one. I will never cast anyone out. The person who looks and believes will live forever. And the only way, only way that is going to happen is if Jesus dies for us. So he is giving his flesh and blood for us so that we can live. What's the bottom line? This phrase, eating and drinking his flesh and blood, is metaphorical, symbolic language for believing. We've seen symbolic language already in the book of John. Remember John chapter 4? Jesus sees a man named Nicodemus. And what does Jesus tell him? You must be born again. That's metaphorical, symbolic speech. Nicodemus had no clue how to interpret that. In fact, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And now here we see it again in John chapter 6. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And how do they respond? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? You're kind of waiting on Jesus to jump in and say, no, you're still not getting it. You must believe in the one that God sent to give his flesh and blood for you, to die for you, so that you can live eternally. And so it is Jesus that accomplishes the decrees of God by dying on the cross for sin. Again, his sacrifice, a complete, satisfactory substitute for the penalty of sin. Verse 40 is very clear. If we look on the Son and believe in Him. And to make sure that those people never forget. And to make sure that every generation from the time of Jesus to today, for as long as time exists, Jesus, a little bit later in John, institutes the Lord's Supper. We call it Holy Communion to explain all of this language of eat my flesh and drink my blood. And we find the words of institution in a couple of the gospel books, but mostly in 1 Corinthians 13. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now the pieces are beginning to come together. We now see the true meaning of this metaphorical language. Eat the flesh and drink the blood is really to believe. These words of Jesus are not only metaphorical for believing in him, but now he makes these words symbolic as a way to remember. 
the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is a way instituted for us by the Lord Jesus to remember what Christ has done for us, paying the price of sin by his flesh and blood by dying on the cross as our substitute. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, as a memorial so that we would never forget about the plan of God and who is going to accomplish the plan. We know that the presence of Christ is here and the gospel message is declared as we commune with our Savior. We know that we are not eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood, but we are remembering him. We are declaring our attachment to him. We are enjoying his presence in our heart and in our lives. Verse 56, I love, says we are abiding in him and he abiding in us. And that's why we come, because he has called us to come. And it is a commemorative way for us to remember. We know the presence of Christ is here. But we must also know, let's not be confused, that the bread and the wine are representations, not actual flesh and blood. The reason that Jesus instituted it for us is so that we would remember. And that's very important for us as we come to the table this morning. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your word to us. We are thankful for your decree that you have chosen to save your people, that you had a plan even from the beginning, even before the world was created even before the first sin was committed, to save your people. We are so thankful for that, and we rest in that. God, we are also very grateful that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who accomplishes your plan, and that he did it as the perfect sacrificial lamb, sacrificing himself, the giving of his body and blood for us. And Lord, we are grateful that he has instituted for us this table not only to remind us of what you have done, Lord, but also to strengthen us in all that we do. Lord, thank you for this table. Thank you for all that it represents. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. And now receive the benediction. May the grace and peace of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
Thanks for joining us for Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful that you were able to take part in worship with us, and we hope that the time you've spent here has been an encouragement to you. Please remember to stay in touch, and if there's something you need or something you'd like for us to lift up in prayer, call us at 706-210-9090. Of course, please continue to pray for each other and for those who lead us that they would seek God in their decisions. And don't forget to come back again to our website, myccp.faith, or the Christchurch Facebook page to be a part of worship at Christchurch Presbyterian. <laughs>